Amen. Those are beautiful words to sing, true words, and uh, I trust comforting words. Please turn with me to Jonah chapter 3. We're going to pick up where we left off several weeks ago, and we are into this new setting in the story of Jonah, Jonah 3, out of a fish and into a city. Let's read Jonah chapter 3. I'll read the whole chapter. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Let's pray. Oh, Father, as we heard this morning, we thank you that you are a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Thank you that you have this word for us tonight. And we pray that you would instruct us in your gracious ways what it means to believe your words, what it means to repent, to turn from our evil way and the sins that we commit by our hands, and what it means to know your peace and your mercy, to know you relenting from the judgment, the disaster that you promise upon all those who are still in their sins and without Christ. We pray that you would instruct us now by your Spirit, through your Word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, as a bit of a review, as you go through the four chapters of Jonah, this is a book that really highlights some of the attributes of God the goodness of God, and the greatness of God. And so far we have seen how God is great in power. He hates sin. He's warning this evil city, Nineveh. He wants Jonah to go and warn them as his prophet that there is judgment awaiting them. And from chapter 1 onward, so far, Jonah has not been willing to give that message. And we're not told exactly why. It's not until the end of the, near the end of the book you, you understand that, and it helps you kind of understand the whole book. But so far, all we know is he has not wanted to go, and so he has fled from before the face of the Lord, from the Lord's presence. And Jonah now, he contributes evil alongside Nineveh by his own disobedience. He, as God's prophet, disobeys and he starts to feel the effects 
of God's disaster upon him, God's punishment. And that is in chapter 1. A storm is sent by the Lord, this great storm, uh, the bad weather, the ra'ah weather, as the sailors call it, this evil from the Lord, bad weather. And it's for Jonah's evil, his disobedience. And God mercifully has a fish swallow him up rather than perish in the water. And it's from the belly of the fish Jonah prays. He stops running from God. He seeks the presence of God. And he glorifies God for being good and great. And he submits to what God wants him to do. And I'd encourage you to go back to those messages. They're on Sermon Audio. And building off of those, we're going into now chapter 3. And we start off with a, a similar scene. The word of the Lord coming to Jonah, just like as before in chapter 1. But note here, it's a second time. And God says essentially the same thing to Jonah. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah was to wipe the fish guts off himself. He's on dry ground now, but God's word tells him, get up and go do what you were supposed to do in the beginning. And so this is the opening scene now in chapter 3. And so rather than meeting with some sailors on a boat, Jonah is going to meet with some wicked pagans in a city. And we're going to see the greatness and goodness of God by seeing these pagans repent of their sins and God accept that repentance and relent from the judgment that he said he would do upon them. This is where we see God's greatness and goodness in this part of the story of Jonah. And so Jonah does obey. This time he goes, says verse 3, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Notice how here this is from God's perspective. He has given out his word. His word should have been already obeyed. Now finally, after learning some things, Jonah goes and he's going to this great city. And so going into verse 3, we have a scene change. Jonah's perspective now, not the Lord's perspective, uh, as, as how the story is being seen through. But now we are in Jonah's shoes and he, we see him arriving in Nineveh. Notice there's not a lot of talk about what was the journey like? Did he bring some gifts for the leaders? How did he get into the city? You know, you can't just walk into these walled cities. We're not told all those details. We're told what God wants us to know from this story. We're told the theological, the, the truth that is meant to change us and help us love God and love others. And so now we're in Nineveh. He's entering Nineveh and we're having a description of this city. Note halfway through verse 3, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Uh, literally, it's, it's a city to God. Uh, it's an interesting phrase in the Hebrew. Maybe some of your English translations translate that a certain way. But uh, this was a very notable city, bigger than Jerusalem in its size, in the amount of people it had. And he goes on and says here, the description is, it's a three days journey in breadth. Most likely meaning that it would take you three whole days to walk through this city. I don't know how long it would take you to walk from one corner of Edmonton to the other, but you, you can imagine, for, and especially for people who are used to walking around, as ancient people were, I mean, this was a very large city to take you that long to walk through. Nineveh is the ancient uh, city that now the city called Mosul is situated in. The Tigris River, which runs through modern-day Iraq, Mosul is on the opposite side of Nineveh, what was Nineveh. Uh, maybe some of you remember Mosul. This is where uh, ISIS, or Daesh, as they're also called, they, they took over this city 
and they were doing very wicked things, imposing Sharia law there. And uh, the Iraqi soldiers, with, with the Canadians' help and Western help, they went in and they actually took that city back from ISIS because it was completely overrun. And so it's still a notable city. They're rebuilding now. Uh, but this is where Nineveh was located. And it was a part of the Assyrian Empire. Now, Jonah, as we established in the first message of this series, he lived in the 8th century, so between the 800 to 700 BC, so before Christ's coming, 8th century BC. And around this time, the Assyrian Empire uh, was growing in power. They were not the most powerful yet in Jonah's day, but they were getting more and more powerful. In fact, just some decades after Jonah's lifetime, near the end of the 8th century, this is the empire that would take over the northern kingdom. You can read about this in 2 Kings. It's the Assyrians who scatter the tribes of Israel to the north. They did very wicked things, very violent things to the Israelis. And they got so far as up to Jerusalem. You could read under King Hezekiah. Sennacherib and the Rabshaka, the, the messenger of King Sennacherib, threatening to take over Jerusalem. But God sends an angel and kills a bunch of the army. I think it's 185,000 in a night. Uh, what, what's fascinating about that, they've dug up some of these things from this king. And they have a, a, uh, a, a monument, basically, which describes his conquering. Sennacherib's victories in war. And I don't know where, what museum has this, but, you know, it's, it's maybe the London Museum. England seems to have all this stuff. They stole it from everybody. So it's there, and when he gets to Judah, talking about Jerusalem, he doesn't describe all the slaves he got out of the city like all these other cities. He doesn't describe what he did to the king he just simply says, I had them shut up in a cage like a bird. And then he leaves it at that. Then he goes on to talk about the other places that he totally burnt, totally ravaged. But very interestingly, he can't say that about Jerusalem. Now, he's not willing to say something really crazy happened with an angel killing all my army. <laughs> that would be kind of humiliating. But just a little interesting artifact that shows you this king didn't conquer Jerusalem. And the Bible records why. So in Jonah's day, these Assyrians were not yet that powerful. In fact, some uh, commentators think that during Jonah's time, they, they, they were going through a hard season. Things were not going well for them. They were divided. The economy was bad. And maybe God used some of that to get their attention. We, we don't know for sure, but there's some evidence of that. But it was still a great city, a big city. Now, the point here in the text is that it wasn't an Israeli city. It wasn't a Jewish city. It was a pagan city. It was a godless city, an idol-worshipping city. We can imagine what Jonah felt as he would be entering in. And he might have looked different, and he would have spoke different. And uh, sadly, some things would have probably looked similar to the northern kingdom as they were involved in idolatry when they shouldn't be. But Jonah's spirit, no doubt, would have been provoked within him, as Paul's was when he was in Athens. Now, Jonah was uncomfortable being here, no doubt. But he went, and he goes deep into the city. Notice that. Jonah began, verse 4, to go into the city, going a day's journey. So he goes deep into the city, like going deep into a fish. Now he's there in this part of where God wants him to be. And he cries out his message of doom. He wants to give them God's message as God wants him. So he says, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Did he say more than that? We're, we're not sure. What we have recorded here is simply this statement. But the way the Holy Spirit has recorded it, I think it's instructive about Jonah's mentality at this time. Often with the prophets, you know, go, go before or after Jonah in these books of the prophets, and you'll notice how they preach. 
Yes, they gave very serious warnings about sin, about judgment that is coming. But they didn't stop short of that. They often appealed to God's people to know the Lord, to repent, to turn from him, and God would be merciful. This is not the preaching that we see from Jonah towards the Ninevites. And the only hint we get that maybe the Ninevites would have latched onto is that timeline. He didn't just say Nineveh shall be overthrown. He said yet 40 days. There was this window of time. And this is exactly what the Ninevites do. Verse 5, their response. So same scene, Jonah's perspective, but he would have been watching to his disbelief in some ways or to his frustration. Maybe not disbelief, but to his frustration that God was being merciful and gracious People were actually responding to him. And they believed God, verse 5 says. The people of Nineveh believed God. So what does this mean? That they believed God. Did they believe in God? Well, Jonah, we have no evidence that he proclaimed to them the name of Yahweh, as we heard this morning. He did not go and say, the God of our fathers revealed himself to us as Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, and he would have given them a very clear explanation of who God is. We don't have any evidence of that. He's using the term Elohim, the generic term for God. And so how much did these Ninevites know about the one true living God? Probably not a lot. They wouldn't have known so much. And yet, they did believe that the God of Jonah was capable of overthrowing their city, capable of sending disaster upon them. They believed Jonah's words. More importantly, they believed God's words. This man speaks the words of this God who does have the power to do this against us. And they believe these words. The word there, believe, it is the word that we transliterate amen from. So they amened what Jonah was saying. They believed it as trustworthy. They said, yes, so be it. This is a firm word. It's going to happen. And we need to respond Accordingly. So they believed the words of Jonah. Now, they had further responses, though, as well. Notice what continues to be written here. They did not just leave this acknowledgement of the truth of Jonah's words in their heart. It says that they called for a fast and they put on sackcloth. All of them did this, from the greatest of them to the least of them. So they not only believed, but they called, they put on. They were like those sailors in the ship just in chapter 1. How they saw the storm and they believed this was an evil, this was a disaster, a ra'ah in the Hebrew, from the Lord or from a God, from somebody's God. And as they pressed in on Jonah, and is in chapter 1, they wanted to do something about it. They knew they couldn't just agree to this, but then change nothing. There was change going on here. These Ninevites voiced out their belief that these words were really from God. They called out and they called a fast. They encouraged each other to humble themselves, put away your food, put away your normal routines, and put on this sackcloth. Get rid of your fancy clothes, get rid of your comfortable clothes. We need to show that we are in trouble. We mean what we are saying and what we think about this. And it shows up in this Very Old Testament-like way, but this physical way, they put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them to the least of them, it says. And the greatest of them, the king, 
is included in this. And this is the next scene. So here's Jonah now watching this unfold, probably very angry about it. <laughs> and then in verse 6, we go from the streets of Nineveh, and Jonah's perspective, and we are brought to the king of Nineveh's perspective. It's like we are ushered into the throne room in verse 6. We follow the word reaching the king of Nineveh. He himself hears about this, and he has a similar response as the people. It says, He arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Kind of a full cycle of action here. He began with a throne robed in purple and other kinds of regalia, but he ends sitting on a heap of ashes in sackcloth. Now this ought to cause us amazement. Uh, imagine one of our leaders here in Canada doing something like this. Imagine one of our politicians going, making a special news conference saying, I have been wrong about so many things and the way I've been handling things. I am so sorry, and I've said this to God. And he takes off his suit, and he, he wears, I don't know what the equivalent now would be, uh, you know, just a, uh, a, you know, a tank top or something that's all beat up with oil spills on it or something. <laughs> something really lowly, something that, you know, it definitely didn't cost a bunch of taxpayer money to put that on. And he humbles himself. I don't know of a modern politician that has ever done something like this, let alone just apologized for doing something wrong. I mean, our leaders, leaders in general, Kings, especially, of the ancient world. You could not often find them saying sorry for something. They will ignore, they will spin, they will deflect, they will do all kinds of things. And they know people know, but they'll do it anyways. Because, you know, the news cycle, people will forget it and on to the next thing. This is how rulers think. Let's distract them with something else. The king of Nineveh, this is a work of God. He repents like this. He, he shows his humility in this way. But that's not all. We really get a sense of all the Ninevites' response, from the greatest to the lesser, by this proclamation that he makes. So specific words that the king does. As the chief sailor represented the rest of the sailors in chapter 1, here now we have the king of Nineveh representing the rest of the city of Nineveh. And he makes a decree. And he wants it said to everybody, he says, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. And so here we start to see these responses of repentance, of what repentance, according to the Bible, actually looks, at, looks like. Very interesting, he begins and includes these animals, these living beings that are also liable to destruction, if God would so choose to do that within the 40 days. He wants the people to take even their property, their belongings, and what they do with what they own would reflect their humility, their repentance. So there's a physical aspect here of humbling oneself and being repentant toward God. But notice as well, there is an earnest prayer that he calls for, to call out to God mightily. Or it could be literally in strength or in might, call out to God. So he's commanding prayer. Now this is a major theme throughout Jonah. As Jonah is hiding on the, the bottom of that ship, what does the chief sailor tell him to do? Cry out to your God. It's not what Jonah wants to do. It's not what anybody wants to do when they're fleeing from fellowship with the Lord because they want to hold on to their sin. They don't want to submit themselves to God. Prayer is diminished. 
I'm not just talking about public prayer, real prayer, prayer in the secret place. That starts to go away. One cannot bear it until they're made right with the Lord. And so here we have this king saying, everybody needs to pray. It took Jonah being brought into the belly of a fish for him to finally pray to God, as in chapter 2. It didn't take the king so much. The king is quick to say, we need to talk with the Lord. But notice what he also says. He doesn't just stop there. He says, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. So they not only showed their repentance in their physical demeanor, the frown on their face, they, they stopped using their property the same way, and they not only prayed to God, but there is a turning that is called for here, a giving up of one's sinful life. The king here talks of the evil way that he is to turn away from, that they are to turn away from. And specifically, he notes the violence that is in their hands. Now, this is interesting, that not only is it generalized, okay, all the evil paths that you're on, but he specifically says the violence that is in our hands. Now, Nineveh was known as a violent city. The Assyrians were known as violent people. There's archaeological uh, monuments as well that have been dug up, and you see the kinds of portraits the Assyrian kings plastered around their palace. I don't know who would really want this, but you know, people naked, strung together by hooks in their back, uh, their skin pierced with these lines, and then being paraded out of their cities. I don't know if a king would sit back and drink wine and look at that and stare at it and smile. That very, very wicked. But this is what the Assyrians gloried in. They gloried in this earthly might and this violence. And now the king, with the law of God written on his heart, recognizing deep down this is wrong, as everybody deep down does, he's saying, specifically, we need to repent of this. So it's not just a general, I am sorry, God. No, no, he gets specific, and so do we in our own fight against sin. We need to be specific with the Lord. What have these hands been used for? What do I need to seek forgiveness from the Lord for? What do I need to turn from specifically so that these hands don't continue in that specific evil path? Now, this word turn, it's a very significant word in the scriptures. It describes an important aspect of repentance. Not only a change of mind, but a change of mind that results in a turning of the body, a a turning of the will, so that the same bad choices, the path of sin, is no longer being followed. There's a new path, a godly path, a path that Christ points out. That instead your will is turning toward and you are now going on. This word is used for the turning of the body. But it's also used for the turning of the soul. And the turning of the whole life away from sin and to God. And this is what he rightly emphasizes here. And why does he do this? What is the reason? Well, verse 9 The king finishes his proclamation. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. He believed mercy was possible with this God of Jonah. He didn't believe he was entitled to it. Notice that who knows expression. There was a sense of urgency and recognition. We wouldn't deserve this, but this God may relent from this punishment he is to put on us. He warns us about. Now, Hopefully you caught this interesting repetition of words as well. Notice how the king speaks of this. God may turn 
and relent and turn from his fierce anger. Well, if you're wondering, it's the same Hebrew word for the turn that was used earlier. Uh, Verse 8, let everyone turn from his evil way. When a sinner turns from sin, God is pleased to turn from the consequences of sin, the punishment of sin. There's a turning going on among both parties here. And the king believes God can do this. There's another interesting play on words here. Not as clear, but if you joined us for the the first sermon in the series, I pointed out a a repeated word throughout Jonah. The word evil or disaster, sometimes translated as displeasure throughout this book. And that is that Hebrew word, ra'ah, understood as something that is bad, right? So sin is sometimes called by this term. That means bad behavior. But a disaster, a storm like in chapter 1, this is also called ra'ah. God will send this kind of bad towards sinners doing bad. It is bad weather. Later, Jonah in chapter 4, he's going to feel really bad. He feels ra'ah. Now, not only is he sinning, he's going to be really stubborn before the Lord, but it, 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 it speaks of a kind of sadness or just a bad feeling. That's probably the best English word we can translate this word with. It's just bad, and you use it in all kinds of different contexts. Well, here, the king is saying, let everyone turn from his bad way, from his ra'ah way. And later it says, who knows, he says, who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And then in verse 10, it says, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. God relents of this bad punishment, same word, this ra'ah that he's going to do to them. And so, bringing on God's disaster by our own sin, this is what we deserve. This is what our bad behavior elicits from a good God. It's a bad consequence. But the king is believing and understanding that if they repent, and repent in the way that was just described, a biblical way, then God would relent from what he's going to do. Some people have said judgment is not a motive for repentance. But passages like this really seem to go against that kind of teaching. (laughs) Now, it, it may not be the only motive. And if you are in Christ, if you're following Jesus, there should be more than just a fear of hell going on and and why you're seeking the Lord rather than your sin. But God's judgment is real. These are real warnings. And they are worthy to be considered and turned from. But one may consider, okay, God has already announced this. God is just, wow, these Ninevites are really wicked. This is just maybe a pagan who thinks that God changes his mind like a human does. You know, they understood the gods to be fickle and and kind of like a soap opera up in heaven. You know, this isn't the true. He's already said what he's going to do. So the silly pagan, uh, no, it's too late. God already said in 40 days he will bring this disaster upon them. But God doesn't do it. Now we get God's perspective. Away from the kings and now finally, verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, that ra'ah, that bad behavior, God relented of the disaster of his bad that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. We don't know how much time took place between them first responding and God making a firm 
decision, okay, I will not bring this judgment about. I mean, on day 41, they probably looked around and, and said, hooray, great. But at some point, God makes this declaration. He, he himself in his heart, as is revealed here, he relents of this disaster. He ultimately does not do it to them. God saw that their repentance was genuine. They biblically and sincerely humbled themselves before him, called out to him for forgiveness, and turned. They made changes so that they would not continue in that same pattern of sinful behavior. And so he does not bring that judgment upon them. He relents. That is a repeated word here. When God relents, it's not quite as man would relent. This is the same word the Hebrews would use for regretting or feeling so sorry for something that you then change uh, your mind about something. It can be used in all kinds of ways among humans. But here, God makes a decision to change the course of what he was going to do. Now, we want to take a step back and say, well, God eternally decreed all things, and I believe that. But I also believe, on the condition of the Ninevites repenting, God relented. Now, in eternity past, did he decide to do that? I'll leave that up to God to really sort out. Theologically, I would, I would say this, yes, But the text is not saying that. The secret things belonging to the Lord our God are not being detailed here. What is being detailed is that in response to this city's repentance, God determined to not punish them. He relented of what he said he was going to do. And this is very punctuated. Even the writer of Jonah knows that his readers will feel the kind of uncomfortable uh, idea with this. Notice how it's said here at the end. It's almost repeated. God relented of the disaster that he, would said, that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. That, that, that last, and he did not do it, that needn't have been put there. But it's almost like a stamp. It's kind of like Jonah rubbing it in a little bit. He said he would do it to them, and he did not do it. Just to make you more theologically uncomfortable. (laughs) But we ought to understand that God delights in forgiveness. He delights in showing mercy. What does he say through the prophet Ezekiel? That he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But he would rather the wicked person turn and be healed, his life be spared. Elsewhere throughout Scripture, Luke 15, I mean, Jesus' parables about the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son, all describing the joy that God feels when one sinner repents. Joy, delight. He loves to receive repentant sinners. This is in his nature as the God who is love. 1 John 4 defines God as love. Because of sin, in his holy character, he makes a response towards sin. But he is always eternally loving. Before there was one sinner, one fallen angel to have to deal with. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit enjoyed love toward one another. God delights in this. He delights in life. He delights ultimately in mercy and what promotes such things. And so we should not be surprised that God determines that he will receive these repentant sinners and not bring this judgment. Jeremiah 18 Verses 7 through 8, very instructive passage. He says through Jeremiah, If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom 
that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. Very clearly, God says this through the prophet Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was preaching to the leaders of Jerusalem, saying, Repent. Look what God says. If you repent, he will forgive. He won't bring about this judgment upon you. And they don't repent. And ultimately, God leaves them in that hardened state and says, Now the time for forgiveness is gone. But God delights in responding to this repentance. Now, the Ninevites, were they desperate? Yeah, maybe. I mean, how much did they know about God and his ways, like we said earlier? Probably not much. We're not told all the reasons that would have went into them responding so powerfully, but we know it ultimately comes from the Spirit of God. People would call this a revival, a revival in Nineveh. But they simply knew they were doing wrong. And this God of Jonah was right to punish them. And so they repented. Now we as God's people, knowing so much more about the Lord, having so much more revelation about his glory, about his character, about the fullness of consequences that await those who remain in their sin, we as God's people should be all the more eager, all the more quick to respond in repentance for our sins, to trust that God will keep his word, but he delights to bring forgiveness and to bring mercy. There is definitely a contrast going on here between how God's prophet responded to his own sin and a commandment from the Lord and how these Ninevites respond. Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord, but the Ninevites didn't. Jonah thought that he could continue on in a sinful path and there would be no real consequence that would ultimately get to him. And God really showed him, no, your sin will find you out. God sent the storm. God sent the fish. God made sure that Jonah's life was very uncomfortable until Jonah humbled himself, prayed, and turned from his own sinful, disobedient path. And so we need to be like these Ninevites. You often don't hear a preacher saying that, but <laughs> they didn't want to test the Lord and go down that path. Maybe on day 39, that's when we'll repent. Let's party for 39 days and then, ah, sure, right, right at the 11th hour, that's when we'll get right with this God. They didn't think like that. They believed that this path that they were on was ending in trouble. And before God had to bring on any storms, really anything like he had to do for Jonah, they responded to God's word early, and they were blessed in that. God relents of the consequences he could have put on them. So for all of us tonight here, we have various struggles against sin. And yet we cannot deceive ourselves into thinking that God's word will fall to the ground and not be fulfilled in our lives. That if we continue down a sinful path, stubbornly holding on to our own sin, that they won't have a consequence in our life. God wants us to believe him and respond in this kind of humble way before he'd have to chasten us out of love. If you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord as your Savior yet, you are heading toward the greatest of consequences. And that is towards the lake of fire. That is towards a torment that is never ending. And once you face that, there's no going back. There's no fish in the lake of fire that swallows you up and brings you back out of it. 
That truly is the, the pit, the Sheol, that the, the dead will never ultimately come out of. For the wicked who go there, you will only be raised again eventually, well, raised from hell in order to be thrown into there. This is not what has to be in your life. God delights to relent from that kind of ultimate consequence for sin. And so turn to him, talk with him, call out to him now in your youth. And may you know his salvation through Christ. But let's all pray. In what ways are we to present these hands to the Lord and say, Lord, I've used them for evil. Help me no longer be on that path. My property, many of us don't own livestock, but my property will be reflecting this repentance in in how I use it, how I dress it, dress it all with sackcloth, Call out to the Lord and help one another now turn from the evil path that we are tempted on. Jesus Christ is the one we turn to. Uh, Jonah wasn't preaching Christ at this time, but we are blessed to be able to know that Christ has done everything. He has taken on that disaster from the Lord at the cross so that we can be sure we don't have to when we trust in him. And so may we put our trust in him again and again, including tonight. Let's pray. O Lord Jesus, truly you are the merciful and gracious Savior that we need. We have all fallen short of your glory. We have all been on an evil path. It may not be a violent path, though some of us are guilty for violence, But in one way or another, we have used hands, we have used our feet, we have walked and and done evilly before you. And if you were to mark our iniquities, if you were to cry out against our sins, we know that that disaster, that consequence would be just against us. You would be right in the doing of it. But, O Lord, we thank you. You delight in mercy. You rejoice when one sinner repents and returns to you. And so may this be an encouragement to us to tremble at your word, to take your word serious, but that seriousness to result in a believing upon you, a turning from sin, and a knowing of your peace rather than your disaster. O Lord, help us not flee from you like Jonah tried to do. But help us respond to you immediately. Grant that we would take what we have heard tonight. May you apply it in each of our lives. O Lord, we thank you that you have done everything we need at the cross and in your resurrection, Lord Jesus, to know that our sins can be forgiven. And we pray that each person here would be resting upon your finished work and would know your strength to now live accordingly, to live in a worthy way. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.